This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Aushra and Danuta. It's applicable to both F7 and to P2. It's P2 revision of the F7 comprehensive example. It's a re-recording because I've updated the question and for those of you checking to make sure you've got the right version on the second line of the question it says Danuta shares had a market value of 220. The earlier example the Danuta shares had a value of 130. So the example has been updated, it's been changed, so just make sure that you have the correct copy of the course notes. Okay, let's read the question. Um, the important bit at the top there tells us about the acquisition and then the notes at the bottom of the question, at the bottom of the page. At the date of acquisition, some of Danuta's inventory had a fair value, 12,000 in excess of carrying value, and all of this had been sold before the year end, so we have a fair value adjustment. And then note two, on the 31st July, Danuta had sold an item of property, plant and equipment, profit on sale 36. Alstra is depreciating it over its remaining use of life of four years. Group policy to charge a full year depreciation in the year of purchase, none in the year of sale. On 1st October, note three, Alstra's dispatch goods to Danuta at a transfer value of 26. She sells goods at a margin, not a markup, at a margin of 30%. Danuta had sold a quarter of these goods by the date of the consolidation. Current accounts don't reconcile because there's some cash in transit from Danuta to Ausra. Ausra didn't receive it until the 2nd of November, so that's after the year end. The year end is October, right at the bottom of the question. Before any necessary adjustment, intergroup balance in Danuta's records showed an amount owing of 11.5. Goodwill is impaired by 25%, okay, so whatever the goodwill figure is, if we impair it by 25%, then we'll get the mark. Profits for two companies, now just that alone tells me it's a mid-year acquisition, because there's no need for us to know what the profit of the companies is for the, the year. But the profits are 70,060, both companies have declared not yet accounted for a dividend, 10 cents for Ausra, 3 cents per share for Danuta. Directors valued the NCI on a fair value basis using market value of Danuta shares as a fair measure. Right. Without looking at the figures themselves, at the top of the question we've got the details of the acquisition. When Ausra bought 75% of Danuta's 50 cent equity shares, the value of the shares was 430. The value of Alstra shares was 430 and the Danuta shares had a market value of 220. In terms of the acquisition were a combination, three shares acquired, for every three shares acquired we issued one of our own, a payment of 121, so we've got deferred consideration payable on 1st of April, which is two years away, so we're going to have to discount that payment to get the present value. And a payment of 60 cents per share required immediately. The cost of capital is 10% and only the cash payment has so far been recorded. All right. Now if we look at the numbers in the Ausra column, it says investment in Danuta 36,000 and that's the only record of the acquisition so far. Well, we can work out from that. Interesting because we do know the percentage acquired. It tells us in the top line. But we can work out just from that information, 36,000 investment in Danuta, that that's the only record of the acquisition. And the only recorded element is the 60 cents per share. So if I divide 36,000 by 60 cents, that gives me 60,000. And that must mean that we acquired 60,000 shares at 60 cents each to give me the 36. And without knowing the top line of we bought 75%, we can work out that we acquired 60,000 shares and if we look in Danuta column, the equity shares of 50 cents, it means that's $40,000 worth, 80,000 shares, that gives me the 75%. Now it's unlikely that your examiner is going to do that, it's unlikely he's going to just give you the cash element, but if he does give you the cash element and say that that's the only bit which has been recorded, 
then we can work out that 60,000 shares have been bought, 80,000 shares is the number of shares in Danute, therefore we've acquired 75%. But he's not likely to do that. He's more likely going to say, as he normally does, that we acquired 75% of the shares. Okay, working one is the group structure, Ausra and Danuta. We know we bought 75%, we know therefore there's a 25% non-controlling interest. And the other element that we need to put into working one, and it's just really a reminder for ourselves, that this is bought part way through the year. We bought them on the 31st of March, and the year end is going to go to October, so if I count on my fingers, that's April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So it's five months pre and seven months post. And we're going to have to time a portion this year's Danuta retained earnings in order to find out what the retained earnings figure and the net asset figure of Danuta was at date of acquisition. So we need to time a portion. This is an unusual time apportionment. If we look and we'll see in note 6 that Danuta's profits for the year was 60,000 before any adjustments necessary, it looks like it's a straightforward 5 twelfths pre-acquisition, 7 twelfths post-acquisition. But as in all these F-level papers, and particularly in F7, dates are important. And if I look at note number 2, on the 31st of July, that is in the post-acquisition period, Danuta sold an item of property, realizing a profit on sale of 36000 That is not a normal profit. That's not profit from trading activities. So this figure of 60000 which is the Danuta profit for the year, includes that 36000 So if I look at the profit for the year, and I have to split it, I need to deduct the profit on the TNCA transfer, which is 36000 which means that there's only 24000 what I'm going to call normal profits, if I can spell it right, normal profits. And that's the figure that we're going to split. If we split it into 5 twelfths and 7 twelfths, that's 10,000 pre-acquisition and 14,000 post-acquisition. That's the profit split of the normal profits. That gives me 24,000 profit for the year. But I know that Danuta has recorded 60,000, so I'm now going to add the profit on the TNCA transfer to this post-acquisition profit. So there's my 50,000 post-acquisition and 10,000 pre-acquisition. There's my 60,000 profit for Danuta for the year. And it's that pre-acquisition normal profits which of course is going to be part of the retained earnings at date of acquisition by Austria of Danuta. So now I can think about working two. Now we covered in the last chapter, we covered the concept of a share for share exchange and there are many exercises at the back of the notes, I think it's many exercises number 10, where there are six or seven examples of share for share exchanges. So I'm going to leave you for a moment and just see if you can work out the number of shares and the value of our Ausra shares that we gave in exchange for the acquisition of 75% of Danuta. If you struggle with this, I suggest you practice with those seven, six or seven exercises in the mini exercises at the back of the notes because this is highly probable in both F7 and in P2 that no longer are we now normally faced with uh, Ausra bought Danuta and paid $22,000 for it we're likely going to be faced with a share for share exchange. So you have to be on top of this. It's got to be right. And the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. Let's have a look then. We bought 75% of 40,000 dollars worth, but they're 50 cent shares, so there's twice as many shares as dollars. 
and we bought 75% of those. And for every three shares acquired, so if I divide by three, I issue one new share in Alstra. So if I work that out, that's 60,000, 20,000, that's 20,000 shares at nominal value that Alstra is issuing. But of course, the Alstra shares have got a value greater than their nominal value. So there is also a premium. And the premium is $4.30, which is the market value, minus the face value of $1. That gives me $3.30. And we issued 20,000 shares. So 20,000 has a value of 66,000 in excess of the nominal value. That deals with the share issue, but now we've also got deferred consideration. And the deferred consideration is $1.21 for each two shares acquired, and it's payable on 1st of April in two years' time. And the number of shares we acquire is 60,000. And for every two, we are going to pay $1.21, but we need to discount that at the rate of, where's the cost of capital there in the sixth, seventh line of the question? We need to discount that at 10%. So multiply by 1, divided by 1.1, and we do that twice because it's two years down the line. Now if I take 121 and divide by 1.1, and then again by 1.1, that gives me a dollar. So it's 60,000 shares divided by 2, which is 30,000, multiplied by a dollar, which is 30,000. And that's the deferred consideration and the value of our shares. But of course, we've also got the cash payment. And we know from the question that that is 36,000. It's actually 60,000 shares at... 0.6 or 60 cents each which gives me 36. That's the cost of the acquisition so far as Alstra is concerned. But now of course we also have the NCI and we're told at the bottom note number eight the directors have valued the NCI on a fair value basis using market value. There are 20,000 shares still held by the non-controlling interest. There were 80,000 shares in Danuta we have acquired 60,000 of those, so the NCI must still hold 20,000. And the value of the Danuta shares, the second line of the question, is $2.20. So that gives me $44,000. And that is the worth of the subsidiary at date of acquisition. If I add that to 60, 80, 180, 196,000. That's the worth of the subsidiary. Now I need to know what is the net asset value, the fair value of the net assets at the date of acquisition. So fair value of the Danuta net assets at date of acquisition, and that's made up of share capital, which we know already is 40,000, but there's also a premium. How do I know that the premium is pre-acquisition? Well, because share premium only arises on the issue of shares, and at F7, it's most improbable, highly unlikely, 99.9% .9 improbable, that, they were, that there will be no subsequent issue of shares by the subsidiary post-acquisition. It could happen at P2, but it's not going to happen at P1. So that 20,000 premium is almost by definition pre-acquisition. Then we've got retained earnings. Now I always do retained earnings brought forward and then retained earnings for the pre-acquisition period this year. The retained earnings of Danuta are 124000 at the end of the year, but we're told in note 6 that 60000 of that was achieved this year. So the brought forward figure must be 124 minus that 60, which is 64000 
and then we've also got retained earnings for the five months which we've just worked out higher up I'll look at it again it's up here it says 10,000 so retained earnings for five months is 10,000 and that's looking like the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary at the date of acquisition but of course it's not because we've also got a fair value adjustment The fair value adjustment relates to the inventory. Note number one tells me that inventory had a fair value 12,000 in excess. If you go back to your basic F3 studies, if we increase inventory, if we increase the assets, then that must mean that the profits also increase. Think of it as a double entry on a balance sheet, that if I increase the asset side by 12,000, then the capital, the equity and the liability side must also increase by 12,000. That 12,000 then is a positive fair value adjustment. It's an increase in the retained earnings as at the date of acquisition. Beware that there are sometimes fair value adjustments in examination questions where the net effect of the fair value adjustment is a reduction of the retained earnings, but this time it's an addition just quickly skip through the rest and make sure there are no other fair value adjustments I don't think there are note 2 is not a fair value that's not a fair value that's a PUP current accounts is cash in transit it's a balance sheet adjustment goodwill is impaired by 25 profits we dealt with both entities have declared no this is at date of acquisition this is at date of acquisition uh, so the dividends don't come into it and we've dealt with point number 8 so the fair value of the subsidiary net assets at date of acquisition is the sum of those five figures. That's 120, 130, 140, 146,000. Now I notice in the printed solution that there is a misprint. It says 5,000 is the difference. Of course it should be 50,000. So 50,000 is the goodwill and we're told in note number five that there's an impairment of 25 percent which is 12,500 now the NCI is valued on a fair value basis and therefore some of that impairment is attributable to the NCI the rest of it is attributable to Ausra the goodwill on the balance sheet is going to be 37,500 and of that impairment some is us and some is the NCI when we're impairing goodwill and the NCI is on a full fair value basis uh, then the NCI is going to suffer their share their proportionate share of that goodwill impairment and so the NCI is going to suffer 25 percent of that which is 3125 and the remainder, which is our 75%, is 9375. Now we'll need that information when we come to working three because we're going to deduct our share of the goodwill impairment when we calculate working three. Beware that the impairment is split because the NCI is on a fair value basis. If they had been proportionately valued, uh, then they have no goodwill and therefore none of that impairment will be attributable to the NCI. I think we're in the position where we can think about PUPs. We do PUPs between working two and working three because the PUPs will come into the calculation of working three the consolidated retained earnings. We've got a PUP in point number two that's a profit on the TNCA transfer if we think about this that 36,000 asset is still within the group and therefore that transfer within the group is not so far as the group is concerned it's not a realized profit so 36,000 is the PUP which has been recognized by Danuta but which has not been realized so far as the group is concerned but of course with an item of property plant and equipment that Danuta has sold to Ausra, Ausra is now depreciating it on this 
uh, carrying value, which is 36,000 greater than its true carrying value if it had not been transferred. So Alstra is depreciating this, this unrealized profit element of the TNCA. And we're told in note number two that uh, Alstra is depreciating it over its remaining useful life of four years. 36,000 divided by four is 9,000. Its group policy to charge a full year's depreciation in the year of purchase and none in the year of sale. So, uh, so Danuta has not charged any depreciation on this asset this year, uh, but Alstra is going to. And the depreciation is a full year, 25 per, sorry, yeah, 25% over four years, 25% of 36,000 is 9,000 depreciation. And that means that there is 27,000 profit left, unrealized, and that adjustment, that PUP adjustment, is entirely recorded in Danuta, in the selling company. That deals with that one. Now this is what I would write in the exam. I would put PUP, I would write my 27,000, I would put in Danuta, in order that if I don't get time, at least I scored the marks. If I don't get time to do the final consolidated statement of financial position, I've still scored the mark for calculating the PUP and for identifying that the adjustment is in Danuta. Note number three is a PUP on inventory. Because on the 1st of October, Ausher has dispatched goods to Danuta to transfer value of 26. Ausher sells goods at a margin of 30% and Danuta sold a quarter of these. I always, always, even after all these years, I always put cost plus profit equals selling price. I know the profit margin is 30%. Now I have to ask myself, is that a margin, in which case the 100 is in the selling price, or is it a markup, in which case the 100% is in cost? And this time it's a margin. So 100% is in selling price, therefore cost is 70%. But we don't need that information. That information is most unusual that we'll ever need to know what the true cost of these goods are. This is what we're looking at, the profit element, and it's 30% of the transfer value. So 26,000 times 30% is 7,800. Just check my calculations, but it's 7,800. Okay, now we need to know that Danuta has sold a quarter. So there are three quarters still in inventory. So the PUP is therefore three quarters of 7,800. And again, you'll need to check my calculations, but I'm just going to do it now in my head and see if I can get it right. One quarter of 7,800 is 1950, so three quarters must be 5850. So 5850 is the PUP in, who made the sale? Ausra. And again, I've scored the marks. If I don't get time to make that stock adjustment, if I don't have time to complete my statement of financial position, I've still got the mark for calculating the PUP, on the assumption, of course, that I've calculated it correctly. I hope I have. Right, note number four, current accounts. That's just a cash in transit items. That's nothing to do with profits. Goodwill is impaired, we've done that. Profits for the year, we've got that. Declared but not yet accounted for a dividend. Let's have a look at the dividend. This is note number seven, dividends. For Ausra, it's 10 cents per share. Ausra has a share capital of 100,000. But she's also just issued a further 20,000 of her own shares on the acquisition. So it's 10% of 100,000 plus that additional 20,000. There is an element of confusion among students that says, well, if we've issued 20,000 shares to Danuta, 
then surely Danuta is going to want some of that dividend that Ausra is paying. But that's wrong. Conceptually, it's totally wrong. That 20,000 shares has not been issued to Danuta Company. It's been issued to the people who were the former shareholders in Danuta. In fact, it would be illegal under UK law for a subsidiary to own shares in its parent company. A company cannot be a member of itself nor of its parent company. So the Ausra dividend is payable to the outside world. It's payable to the Ausra shareholders who did exist last year, plus the new Ausra shareholders who used to be the shareholders in Danuta, but who sold out their investment so that Ausra could acquire 75% of Danuta. So 10 cents per share on 120,000 shares gives me a 12,000 dividend in Ausra. For Danuta, we have a 3 cents per share and there are 80,000 shares in issue. And 3 cents times 80,000 is 2,400 dividend payable in Danuta. Payable. But as soon as Danuta declares this dividend, Ausra says, oh well, 75% of that is mine. So Ausra has got a dividend receivable of 75% of this 2,400 that Danuta is paying. So that will be 1,800 in Ausra receivable. Just let me check further down and see if there's any other adjustments. Both entities are directors. Nope, that should be it. So I should now be in the position where I can do working three, the consolidated retained earnings. I don't know why I've written earnings. I won't normally. I would normally just write cons right ears. That will be enough for me. I keep being asked whether it's acceptable to use abbreviations in the exams. I don't know that you're ever going to score additional marks for writing out in full, for example, Ausra Group. I'll write it and, and, and show you what I'm saying. Ausra Group Consolidated. And think about the time I'm taking to write this. Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. Just look at the time that's passing. Financial Position as at 31 October 2011. All of that, and if you were to do it fully, you'd underline all that, all of that is scoring you zero marks. Think of the time you just wasted writing that. I wouldn't do it. I would not put Ausra Group Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. I would not waste that time doing it consistent comments in all of these exams is I didn't have time, I ran out of time, I spent too long on question one. Well don't. Abbreviate. The exception to that is a comment made by a, I think it was the P2 examiner recently. He says he doesn't like abbreviations. Well of course he doesn't. If you're writing a report to a potential investor of a company there's no point in writing IFRS 5 if the potential reader has no idea what IFRS stands for. There's no point in writing Consolidated Statement of Financial Position or TNCA or Cons Ret Ears. There's no point because people are not going to understand that. He's absolutely right. And before you look, before you look at blah blah, there's no point because this is not professional. But you're looking here in question one of both P7, P, sorry, P2 and F7, you're looking here at consolidation techniques. You're not looking at your ability to communicate particularly. You're not looking at your ability to communicate in professional language. You're looking at your ability to apply principally IFRS. So if you're writing a report, if you're writing a letter, if you're writing a memorandum, unless it's to somebody that can understand, then don't use the abbreviations. You can do. You can put International Financial Reporting Standards Number 5 and then abbreviate it to IFRS and go on from that basis using the abbreviation. But otherwise, 
No, use the abbreviations in question one, but not in any written answer. So the consolidated retained earnings. I always set it up this way. I'm con totally consistent about this. Ausra and Anuta, per the question, is always my top line. Per the question, according to this question, we have 215,000 in Ausra and 124,000 in Danuta. But then, of course, we have some adjustments to make. The adjustments are as a PUP on the TNCA. Now we've already done the working, 27,000, and we've already identified that it's in Danuta. And as a PUP on inventory, and we've already calculated that as 5850 from memory, and it was in Ausra. So that deals with the PUPs. Then we've got dividends payable. For Ausra it was 12,000. For Danuta it was 2,400. And we have a dividend receivable, which is Ausra 75% of that 2,400. So 1,800 receivable by Ausra. And now we come to a, a particular point which is uh, easily overlooked and it goes back to this deferred consideration. When we calculated, I'm just going to go up the screen here, when we calculated this deferred consideration here in working 2, we brought down 121, we discounted it by 1 divided by 1 plus the cost of capital and we did that for 2 years. But since that calculation of 30,000, there has been a period of time, seven months, which has passed. And so we're seven months closer to having to pay this dollar twenty-one on these 30,000 shares. So we need to record as a finance charge the unrolling of the discount. Now that's calculated as 30,000 which was payable seven months ago. The cost of capital is 10%. And that gives me 3,000. And so we are, for a full year, that liability of 30,000 will increase by 3,000. At the end of the full year, uh, then the liability would be recorded as 33,000. Then we would unroll it again next year and it will become 36,300. But of course, it's not a full year. It's only seven months. So 3,000 times 7 twelfths. 12 into 3,000 is 250. 7 twelfths of 250 is 1,750. And that's a, a, an additional expense which poor old Ausra is going to have to record. Now I think that's it. I can't see anything else which is going to affect our retained earnings as at the date of consolidation. So if I add that up, oh dear, can I do that in my head? Uh, six, seven thousand, six, nineteen thousand, six, eighteen, seventeen thousand, eight. So seventeen thousand, eight from there. It's two thousand, eight off two hundred is one hundred and ninety-seven thousand, two. And if I add that up, that's uh, 29,004 coming off 124. That's 5,004 off 100, which is 94,006. Now you please do check my calculations. I think it's right, 197,002, 94,600. Make sure, because I do make stupid mistakes, I do make calculation errors, but just so you make sure that those figures are correct. And see where they're coming from and appreciate the um, concepts behind including those figures. If I now take away the pre-acquisition profits, the pre-act profits in Danuta, now I can find that in working two. I'm going to go back up to working two here. I can find that in working two. The pre-acquisition profits are these figures. It's the retained earnings plus the retained earnings plus the fair value adjustment. That's 86,000. 64, 74, 86,000. Those are the pre acquisition profits in Danuta, which means that the post acquisition is therefore, what is that, 8,600. 
8,600 per stack. And our share, Alstra's share, is 75%. 75% of 8,600 is 6,450. And so the Alstra profits together with her share of the post acquisition Danuta profits is 203,650. And from that, less our share, I'm not going to put our share because I talk about it differently, less goodwill impaired since acquisition, just our share. Just our share, we'd work that out as well in working two, so I'm going back up here to working two, there it is, 9375. So 9375 is our share of the impairment, and that's going to give me 275, 194,275. Again, just check it, make sure you understand where it's coming from, and we can move on. If we do move on, or when we do move on, working 4A is the NCI, and it's 25%. Always worth putting that in. It's so easy, because so far we've only been dealing with 75%, and 75% is, I don't know, maybe fixed in your mind. So it's worthwhile writing down what is the percentage of the NCI. If you put 75, if you apply 75, at least the market can see, yeah, it's a stupid mistake, but it's only one stupid mistake. So although you might come up with NCI at 75%, then you're not going to lose that many marks, so long as you put in the percentage. If you put in the wrong percentage, okay, the marker can see where you've gone wrong, but it's not the end of the earth. Value at date of acquisition. Again, we've worked that out. It's in working too. Back up here to working too. The value of date of acquisition, 44,000. 44,000. Now, that was a... What date was the acquisition? 1st of March? Yeah, 31st of March. That was the date of acquisition. That was the NCI value at date of acquisition. If I give them their share of the subsidiary post-acquisition profits, uh, then that brings them up to date. So share of post ac in Danuta, and that's in working three. It's there. We worked out is eight thousand six hundred as the post acquisition profit in Danuta, and twenty five percent of that is two one five zero. That gives me 46,150 for the NCI. Well, it's not quite finished, is it? Because they've got this, less their share of the goodwill impaired. And that again is in working two. Look at that. This one is in working two. This one is in working three. This one is in working two. You've done all the mathematics. You've done all the, the difficult calculations. The impairment here is 3125. So 3125 is the amount I'm going to charge the NCI with as their share of the goodwill impairment. And that now gives me 43,025 is the NCI on the statement of financial position. And that is it. That's all there is. All that now re remains, that's not quite, is it, because we've got the cash in transit adjustment. But all that now remains is for us to fasten it all together. So in the consolidated statement of financial position, here we go. We've got TNCA. I'm oh, sorry, we've got INCA. What is INCA? Some students ask. What is INCA? Well, you could say it's an ancient tribe of Peruvian um, local people. The, the natives of Peru, or you could apply it to F7 and P2 and it's actually working to its intangible non-current assets. And in working to, from memory, you I know you will check it, 37,500. It was 50,000, it's been impaired by 25%, so the in, in, intangible non-control, yeah, the intangible non-current asset is 37,500. TNCA. This is 
tangible non-current assets and we have an adjustment to make. From the question we have 260,000 plus 200,000 but we have this adjustment we've got this minus 36,000 less the depreciation so 27,000 the TNCA are overstated by 27,000 so that's 460, 433,000 that will do for the non-current assets inventory the first of the current assets per the question 100,000 plus 50,000 but of course there's a PUP involved and the PUP is 5.85 isn't it? yeah it's five, it was 7,600 7,800 but a quarter of that has been sold so three quarters is left so it's 150 minus 585 is 144,150 then we've got receivables would you this is what I would do in the exam you see this Inca TNCA M Vribles that's what I would do I would not be spending time writing out receivables so from the question receivables is 90 and 80 okay but then we've got the dividend we've got 1.8 receivable but that's going to cancel out because we're going to show as a payable in Danuta they're going to show just the dividend which is payable to the outside world to the NCI because if I record it as a receivable in Ausra and a payable in Danuta then I'm going to be double counting aren't I? I'm going to be increasing receivables and increasing payables by this 1800 and it doesn't make sense on consolidation that 1800 is receivable by me sorry yeah it's receivable by me and it's receivable from me in the con in the, the um, situation of Danuta so on consolidation the dividend receivable the intra-group dividend is cancelled okay but we've also got to deal with this cash in transit so let's just have a quick look at that I've not I've not done any working on the cash in transit I'm going to show it down here but then I'm going to rub it out so the current accounts didn't reconcile because Danuta sent a payment to Alstra on your question paper you have receivables cash and payables that's what you have. I'm just going to write out an extract from the question paper. We've got 90,000 and 80,000, 5,000 and 36,000. This is just copying it straight out from the question. Liabilities 116 and 102. Now, all I've done there is copy it out from the question. Imagine that this is your question paper. And what you should now be doing on your question paper, but you also need to reflect it in your answer is recording this in transit item. Danuta sent a payment. The rule for in transit items is to accelerate the in transit item into the records of the receiving company and Alshra is the one receiving. So coming out of the receivables and adding on to cash is this 6500 in transit item. Ausra received it on the 2nd of November so we're going to pretend that Ausra has received it on the 31st October it does belong to the group it's just been held up in the banking system there's the adjustment made for the cash in transit now before any adjustment the intra-group balance in Danuta's records showed an amount owing to Ausra of 11.5 now we have made the adjustment how much of that 11.5 needs to be cancelled well you've got a variety here you can say well it's 6,005 or you could say it's 5,000 11,5 minus 6,5 or you could think it's 11,5 or you could even think it was 18 so it's like an F3 multi-choice question is this which of those four is the amount in Danuta which is still being shown in Danuta as being payable to Ausra before any necessary adjustment it was 11,005 well we've made the necessary adjustment and I haven't touched that 102,000 there is no entry in the Danuta records for this cash in transit so it must still be 11,005 in this 102 so now I need to cancel I need to take 11,5 off receivables and 11,5 
of payables. So now I've got my receivable line. I need to put in the dividend and then take it out again. But there's my receivables line for the purposes of consolidation. 11.5 is the correct choice from the multi-choice questions or multi-choice answers. So here I go again. I'm going back up here now and now I'm going to eliminate this. That's what should have appeared on your question paper. I'm going to eliminate that and go back to my solution. If I take off 11.5 and I take off the 6.5 cash in transit. So that's what, uh, 17, that's 18. Yep, because in Ausra's receivable there was 18 and now we have eliminated it. So that's 18 off that, 62, 152,000. Is it necessary to show plus 1.8, minus 1.8? I've done it for your sakes. If you don't put it in, then fair enough. It's not going to change the 152,000. But I put it in to show that we are, are recording. I put it in up here, didn't I? I put it in up here, the dividend receivable, and we must include that dividend payable minus the 1.8 cancellation. So 1.8 cancels. That, incidentally should also appear on your question paper but also you can see it appears in working three okay I'm down to cash and cash per the question was 5,000 but there's this 6.5 in transit plus 36,000 in Danuta so that's 1.34,500 and I think that that's it for the assets. I think I've got that right. 36 plus, no I've not, I've taken it off, that's stupid. So 11.5, 47,005. Stupid mistake Michael, stupid mistake. 47,500 is the cash. So now I've got the assets. The assets total is 5, 10, that's 150 plus 1, 10, 24, Carry two, ten, twenty one, two, three, four, eight. Is it eight one four one five oh? Just let me check it. Four, five, six, seven, seven, nine, eight, eight, one, five, one, five, eight, one, four, one, five, oh. I think that should be right. Yep. 10, 15, 17, 24. Yes, it is. 10, 15, 17, 20. Yeah, that's right. Shares. Share capital. Always, only, ever. Always, only, ever the parent company. Always, only, ever the holding company. Share capital. It was 100, but we've issued these extra 20. So that's 120,000. And there's a premium as well. We started off with a premium of 30, but remember again from working two, I'm going to go back, I'm sorry about this, but it's the only way I can do it. They've got this premium here of 66,000 at the top of working two. So there's another premium to add on to the existing 30, so plus 66 gives me a premium therefore of 96,000. That's okay. Then we've got retained earnings. And that's in working three. Working three tells me that retained earnings were 194,275. 194,275. And then, of course, we've got the NCI, and that's in working 4A. I would do that. What you see on the screen, apart from always only ever H, what you see on the screen is what I would write in the exam. Working 4A is 43,025. And that gives me. Uh, three, four, two, three, four, four, forty, four hundred and fifty three, three hundred. Four hundred and fifty three, three hundred. Then I've got some long term liabilities. Long term liability. According to the question, it's the three percent debentures. That's thirty thousand plus eighty thousand, a hundred and ten. And that's it, isn't it, for long-term debt? No, it's not, because we've also got the deferred consideration. 
and the deferred consideration it's in working to I'm not going to go shooting back up the screen again it's in working to it was 30,000 but we've unrolled the discount on that and from memory it was 1,750 so the deferred consideration is 31,750 that will unroll further by another 5 months to get it to the full year and then by another 12 months to get it to the full 2 years that we have deferred by so that now gives me equity plus long term debt of 595.050 then I've got current liabilities and per the question it's 116 and 102 but we've reduced that 102 by 11.5 the cancellation of the intra-group balance so that's going to give me 104.5 206.5 and that's the current liabilities per the question as adjusted for the intra-group cancellation. But now we've also got some dividends. We have a dividend payable by Alsha. We worked it out. It's higher up on this screen. It's higher up and it was 12,000. That was 10 cents per share on 120,000 shares. And we've also got the NCI dividend payable. Now that was 2,400 dividend payable by Danuta but we cancel that by 1800 and the cancellation is shown isn't it the cancellation is shown in the receivables so that will leave me with 600 non-controlling interest dividend payable by Danuta I can't think of anything that I've missed what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a total here and if there is a difference then we can try looking for the difference I don't think I've missed anything but we can see so that's five seven eight that's looking good already eleven twelve thirteen fourteen eight hundred and fourteen one five oh does that agree yes it does and that ladies and gentlemen is the revised recording of the Ausha and Anuta comprehensive example it's com called a comprehensive example because as you can see it's got pretty much everything in there certainly for your F7 days, for your F7 tuition that includes pretty much everything that could possibly be asked within an F7 question there may be a bit of reevaluation on a financial instrument going through profit and loss there could be but otherwise that comprehensive example for F7 is as the name suggests comprehensive for P2 it's a revision of your F7 consolidations for P2 you're gonna need to pin your ears back and concentrate on the remainder of the P2 lectures F7 we're going to move on to comprehensive statement of income for P2 we're going to move on to far more complicated consolidations that should be it, that should be sufficient for you.